In the United States and other areas of the English-speaking world, it's very common to group together all East and Southeast Asian peoples, nations, and countries under the umbrella term Asian, or colloquially as Oriental, although people don't really use that term anymore. This is confusing and frustrating to the rest of the world, as not only does Asia include so much more than simply this easternmost region of the continent, but there are also massive differences in and between the East and Southeast Asian populations, with most anthropologists, linguists, and historians defining the line between these two regions as the modern border between the People's Republic of China and its southern neighbors. Although, as with all geopolitical borders, there is an extreme amount of overlap and gradation between the two, perhaps being somewhat akin to the dualistic nature of European and Middle Eastern peoples who have a common root but have diverged considerably in the past. This region is unique in that, for the most part, it was less heavily impacted by the global European influence of the past 500 years than Africa or the Americas were, instead being under the influence of a much more ancient form of pseudo-colonialism. This is, of course, a reference to the very old, very extensive network of settlements, cultural influence, and economic dominance of the Han Chinese in their southern neighbor's territory, which stretches back thousands of years, most likely before the 3rd century BC, when Rome was still in its infancy. Now, it is generally accepted that the whole of Southeast Asia has changed radically over the past 10,000 years, going through different waves of immigration and cultural and religious exchange with the surrounding nations, including, but not limited to, the original Negrito Melanesian peoples of the region, Indians from the South Asian subcontinent, ancient migrants from East Asia unrelated to the modern Han Chinese of today, and Western Europeans, most notably the French, British, Spanish, Dutch, and Portuguese. In fact, many linguists in China actually consider the Hmong Mien and Tai Kadai language families to actually be branches of the Sino-Tibetic macro family, with some even brazenly grouping together Austroasiatic and Austronesians as well, although the PRC is pretty much the only area where this hypothesis is widely accepted. Thus, the region is a fusion of many cultures, with perhaps the exception of northern Vietnam, which is far closer to the Chinese end of the spectrum than any other, and is even sometimes considered to be a part of the Sinosphere, or Greater Chinese Region. It was around the 1st century BC that the Han Dynasty expanded south of the traditional Chinese homeland, taking Guangxi, Yunnan, and parts of northern Vietnam, known to the ancient Han as Zhao Zhi, and for almost 1,000 years, various Chinese dynasties were in control of this large chunk of Vietnam, up until the fall of the Tang Dynasty in 938 AD, and then again very briefly in the 15th century. Even before this, the Chinese in Vietnam, known as Hoa, were responsible for many of the kingdoms and dynasties in northern Vietnam, including the Tran in 1225, as Emperor Tran had ancestral roots in the Fujian province of China, and it was very common for many leaders to have full or partial Chinese ancestry. Although the Hoa have the most extensive history of any diaspora Chinese people, the Han also visited and traded with pre-colonial Filipinos since the 9th century AD, slowly settling in large numbers on the island of Luzon and elsewhere. Likewise, the first Chinese started to settle in Thailand in the 13th century and in the Greater Malay Archipelago, meaning Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore, in the 15th century. Although China never established any formal colonies outside of their contiguous territory, the island of Hainan, which is sometimes considered to be in Southeast Asia, located off the southern coast of Guangdong, was completely absorbed by the Han Dynasty, with the native Li people, a Thai ethnicity, being pushed to the south, while Han Chinese now make up over 82% of the province's population. It is possible that had the Tang or any number of other Chinese dynasties been more aggressive in their southern expansion, perhaps a large part of mainland and maritime Southeast Asia could have become a part of the Chinese nation today, even if indigenous minorities retain their own cultures and languages and pockets, with the majority being assimilated. Even though this never happened, there is precedence for this in that parts of southern China, as well as the island of Taiwan, were actually inhabited by Austronesian speakers some couple thousand years ago, and it was with the migration of the Han from the north that these Austronesians were assimilated into the Han population forever, besides the many aboriginal tribes of Taiwan who, who lie mostly in the impregnable mountain region of the island. 
In almost all of these territories mentioned, it was very common for Chinese men to take native wives and integrate into the prevailing culture, oftentimes converting to Buddhism, Hinduism, even Islam. Because of this and the nature of intermarriage and miscegenation, it's virtually impossible to accurately assess just how many Southeast Asians may have at least one Chinese ancestor from the past 2,000 years, although safe to assume it would be incredibly high. However, it is possible to find out the numbers for much more recent Chinese immigrants and their descendants, mostly due to the higher degree of differentiation between these Chinese and the natives of Southeast Asia, as well as self-identification on government censuses. Although official statistics may not be 100% reliable, as many Chinese do not participate in these censuses or may be illegal immigrants in hiding. However, as usual, we've compiled numbers from a plethora of sources in order to get the most accurate picture. Essentially, the region with the highest percentages and numbers of those of full or partial Chinese ancestry is in this crescent here, stretching from Thailand and peninsular Malaysia to the northern half of Borneo and the Philippines. And this makes sense from a historical perspective, being some of the easiest areas for Chinese migrants to settle in, bordering the South China Sea while the mountainous, densely forested border region between China and mainland Southeast Asia has always been a major hindrance to travel. The country with the largest overall number of ethnic Chinese is definitely Thailand, numbering at least 8.8 .8 million in the present day, with 7.5 million in Malaysia, 4.5 million in Indonesia, and 4.1 million in Singapore. Despite some of the first Chinese settlers arriving in these two countries, the Philippines and Vietnam have some of the lowest numbers and percentages of those of unmixed Chinese ancestry at only 1% each because of the relatively high degree of assimilation and intermixing of the Han in these countries. Here's a map of the areas of Southeast Asia with the highest numbers of historic Chinese immigration, effectively being a population density map of modern Southeast Asian Chinese communities, although this does not necessarily correlate with percentages. As for instance, there are a very high amount of Chinese on Java in the south, but Java is already one of the most densely populated islands in the entire planet. All in all, this adds up to nearly 30 million ethnic Chinese in the entire region, more than the rest of the diaspora of the entire planet combined. And if it were a Chinese province of its own, it would rank 20th in the PRC, about 10% smaller than the Shanghai metropolitan area. However, when expanding to those with at least some known Chinese ancestry, this number jumps up to 85 million, or over one-third of Thailand and one-fourth of the Philippines. The highest percentages are in the four countries of Brunei, Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore at the top, at nearly three-quarters of the population, a fascinating microcosm of Chinese cultures with significant influences from the British, Malay, and Indians as well. Additionally, the Southeast Asian Chinese community is quite religiously diverse, with around 70% practicing either Buddhism or traditional Chinese philosophies like Taoism or Confucianism, while 16% practice Christianity, with Christians and Buddhists being far overrepresented here than in either the PRC or Taiwan. The Chinese of Southeast Asia have been considered a dominant minority in the region for centuries, meaning despite making up only a moderate-sized minority, in most of these countries the Chinese were very heavily overrepresented in politics, trading, land ownership, and especially in the upper class of their economies. Chinese Singaporeans are among the wealthiest groups of people in the entire world with a GDP per capita of 95,000 US dollars. Although interestingly, Indian Singaporeans actually make slightly higher. And although the Chinese in Malaysia, Thailand, the Philippines, and the rest of the region aren't as economically affluent as that, they are still considerably wealthier than their indigenous counterparts. In the past century, due to the extreme degree of Chinese affluence in their new countries, they became subject to a large amount of distrust, violence, and discrimination, especially in Indonesia, along with Cambodia, which was under the rule of the Khmer Rouge at the time and was heavily discriminatory towards all minorities, and Vietnam, which had already been suspicious of Chinese interference following the Vietnam War. This led to the forced expulsion or evacuation of many ethnic Chinese from Southeast Asian countries, and interestingly, Chinese Southeast Asians don't move to China for the most part, instead preferring to move to already economically established Western countries, especially in the Anglosphere. Although around 300,000 Hoa evacuated to neighboring Guangdong province in the PRC. 
Perhaps the only counterexample to this are Thailand and the Philippines, where the Chinese are already very heavily integrated into the native population and currently face no major discrimination in either government or societal institutions. And considering Thailand's quickly growing economy, this gives them little incentive to emigrate. Additionally, the countries of Malaysia and Singapore go to great lengths to preserve the peace between their quote-unquote constituent races that make up their nations, that being the Chinese, Malays, and Indians, fearing that there could be a return to the high ethnic tensions and race riots that followed the post-colonial era. Because the Singaporean birth rate is so incredibly low, basically the only way the country can maintain its population is by having a massive rate of immigration and wanting to more or less maintain the same racial balance that it already has, the overwhelming majority of immigrants are from the PRC. Now, unlike the vast majority of countries I talk about, I actually visited Singapore a few years ago, right before my freshman year of college, and when I talked to a native-born Chinese Singaporean, I was amazed to find that many liken themselves to Americans and see Singapore as the U.S. of Asia, so to speak, drawing parallels to the fact that the majority of the Singaporean population has some immigrant roots from the recent past, even Malay Singaporeans, although a major difference being Singapore was never a de facto colony or territory of China. I've actually met many ethnic Chinese Americans who were born in Vietnam, Malaysia, the Philippines, Indonesia, and they really do consider themselves to be Americans first, having little loyalty to their country of birth, or China for that matter, but not too much content either. I hope you've learned something new about this group that is so little spoken about in other parts of the world, but has had such an unfathomable impact in the past couple thousand years. Be sure to let me know your thoughts on the history of the Chinese in Southeast Asia, and as always, thank you all for watching. This has been Mason, and I'll see you next time.